and to enjoy the presence of God. Thank you for those great songs of faith and victory. And that last song about the wind of the Spirit, I was thinking we're living in times when I believe there is a fresh wind blowing. A fresh wind of the Spirit bringing refreshing to the people of God, bringing a fresh empowerment for service and witness, uh, moving afresh in our lives around us in our circles for the extension of the kingdom of God. And as we open up to that beautiful wind of the Holy Spirit, I think of Elijah at the mouth of the cave and he was looking for the God of the dramatic, but there was a gentle breeze of the Spirit, a fresh calling of for refreshing the Holy Spirit uh, for his life at that time. And I believe God's calling us afresh. At the same time, I believe there's uh, increasing winds of adversity uh, against Christians, against the church, the Christian church, against uh, us as servants of Christ in these days. Uh, but we need to fear not, for God is with us. But we do need to put on our spiritual armour and to enter into prayer and prayer warfare. And how good this church hosts two of the uh, weekly prayer meetings. Thank you on behalf of the Lismore Ministers Fellowship. Uh, the first and second Tuesdays of the month are hosted here. We used to host the second one at Centre Church till the flood hit. Uh, so thank you for your contribution to uh, the combined church's prayer meetings that happen Tuesday 5.30s each week. Uh, but we will need, I believe, to enter increasingly into prayer, prayer warfare in these days, the winds of adversity of society, as society seems to be intentionally moving away from the Judeo-Christian ethic basis uh, of our nation uh, and in our world. And uh, we see uh, in, an increasing level of opposition, but praise God, we have the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, appreciate Pastor Al on our Lismore Ministers Fellowship Circle. What a, a great man. And uh, Pastor Jackie, we're blessed to have her working in the Summerland Christian College front office these days. Uh, I'm semi-retired myself and enjoying it. Uh, I do staff chaplaincy over at Summerland and I do pastoral care for our church. And mine grandkids, oh, so much fun. Uh, but um, my wife uh, gives her apologies today. There's a big story behind that, and I thought I'd share uh, the testimony of that with you, as well as do some teaching from Acts chapter 16. Let's just pray. Lord, we thank you for this time together, and we pray that as we dig into your word, that you would take the seed of truth and wisdom and plant it in our hearts uh, Lord, that as we nurture that by faith, that you would produce uh, fruitfulness in our lives. Help us, Lord, to be responsive to that fresh wind of your spirit and the teaching of your word. Help us, Lord, to stand in faith and victory in these days. And we thank you for your presence here with us this morning. In your wonderful name, Lord Jesus, amen. So Proverbs 3, 6 says, In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. So I'd like to share about seeking God to direct our paths as we have that desire in our hearts. That's why we're here today, to see the will of God accomplished in our lives and around us. Well, on Thursday, the 4th of January... Uh, my wife started to take suddenly ill Thursday afternoon. We'd been out and about around town, had a bit of lunch out, came home and uh, we were preparing for a week's camping with our children, spouses, families, grandchildren uh, up at North Pottsville Beach. Anyhow, uh, we were miraculously, I believe, God directed our paths to the Lismore Base Hospital. Little did we know my wife was having a, a heart attack and she ended up in the hospital via emergency and strapped up to the instruments with a minute or two to spare when she experienced a cardiac arrest. 
So if you're going to have a cardiac arrest, that's the best place to be. And that was God that she ended up there in such a timely fashion. And so they revived her. Uh, her heart went into fibrillation, which is like goes chaotic and stops circulating blood around the body. And so one electric shock with the defibrillator restored the heart rhythm and CPR, the CPR as well. And they revived her. And uh, she uh, is with us to the present day. I did not lose my beloved. Thank you, Lord. And it was just, just a miracle. Yes, thank you, Jesus. It was the way it all happened. I just see the hand of God all over it, down to a minute or two to spare. So uh, she was taken by ambulance after they stabilised her to the John Flynn Hospital on the Gold Coast. And as she arrived, she said it was a quick trip. She heard the siren a few times. Uh, and they took her straight in. She had a stent inserted in the first diagonal artery, artery uh, near the main artery from the heart. And it was 99% blocked. So this, they inserted a stent. Amazing the medical technology and how they do that these days. And it just opens up the blood vessel. And she was in recovery. I'd raced home, uh, grabbed things, thinking I'd be away for a few days, who knows what. Uh, drove uh, not as fast as the ambulance. I tried to be law-abiding. And uh, got there, and I pulled up in the car park at John Flynn Hospital. It was night time by then, wondering where do we go and where's the reception and so on. And my phone rang. I couldn't believe it was Margaret. So thank you, Lord. That was an emotional moment for me. She was calling me to say she'd had the stent procedure and she was in recovery. So uh, praise God for his mercy, his help in time of need. Uh, Psalm 121 says, I'll lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And it goes on to say, he who keeps you will not slumber, uh, and the Lord is my keeper. God was my wife's keeper that day, that's for sure, and he wasn't slumbering, and we were kind of, uh, you know, trying to figure it out in the dark, what was going on, uh, but he is our keeper, and he will preserve us uh, till the end of our days, as allotted by him. Uh, only 10% of people survive a cardiac arrest, which is a serious end of heart attack, uh, in hospital. And if it happens outside, it's much lower again. So I told my wife she's in God's tithe. 10%, isn't that group there? Uh, so in all your ways acknowledge him, he shall direct your paths. And we have that desire for God to direct our paths. And I just want to share some thoughts about finding God's will. And life is full of decisions, full of choices in this world in which we live. More choices than ever, internet and options, and you can buy things online and instead of, you know, three or four choices, you've got 300 or 400. And so to find our way forward in the plan of God uh, is more of a challenge than ever, I, I believe, because there are so many distracting uh, options. So the will of God is that which is good and acceptable and perfect. The will of God is the best thing that could happen to us. And that we have that desire in our heart to accomplish the will of God and to serve God according to his plans, uh, his direction for our life. And so I want to share about what I call the Christian steering wheel, the steering wheel of life and faith, and to talk about the spokes that connect the center, which is God's central guidance, through to our hands-on choices and decisions as we journey through life. Uh, let me read from Acts chapter 16, because we see uh, on Paul's second missionary journey, uh, the establishment of the very first church in Europe, the church in the home of Lydia. So in Acts 16, reading from verse 4, and as they, so that's Paul and his mission team, as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. 
So this was the apostles' teaching, the apostles' instructions. They didn't have the New Testament yet. They had the teachings of Jesus uh, by word of mouth and so on being written down. Uh, and verse 5, so the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. Qualitative and quantitative growth. That's what God loves. Uh, verse 6, now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Now that's not Asia, the con continent, that's Asia Minor. After they had come to uh, Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision... Immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. So they're heading by ship across the water to Greece, the area of Greece. Uh, now notice the uh, pronouns changed from they to we. They came down to Troas and then in verse 10, after he had, that's Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go. So Dr. Luke, who's the human writer of the book of Acts, along with the Gospel of Luke, God's the real author, but Luke's the human writer, and he joins the mission team at this point. So they've got, Paul has found Timothy, Paul and Silas found Timothy, and now Dr. Luke joins the team, and they're headed over to Greece, and they end up in Philippi, and they plant the first church in Europe, and those of us with a European heritage are very grateful that Christianity came to Europe. So, verse 11, Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of the, that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days, and on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside, have a picnic by the river, where prayer was customarily made and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now, a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul and when she and her household were baptised, she begged us, saying, "'If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, "'come to my home and stay.' And she constrained us." And so that was the planting of this house church. And then uh, some other dramatic things happened. The slave girl was uh, d delivered uh, by Paul's ministry in the marketplace, which brought uh, fierce opposition from, uh, you know, the Chamber of Commerce there in that day. And Paul and Silas were thrown in prison. In prison. Luke and Timothy were fortunate, weren't they? Uh, they escaped somehow. Uh, and... Remember, that's the story where Paul and Silas, uh, in the midnight hour, their bodies beaten and bruised and in the agony of their feet in the stocks, which wasn't just to stop them running away, but it was a form of torture. And there, in that horrible circumstance, about midnight, it says, Paul and Silas sang hymns to God. They're expressing praise to God. What a miracle. And God couldn't help himself. He just sort of shook the prison, caused an earthquake, whatever, the doors flung open and the second miracle happened, which was the prisoners, prisoners didn't all escape. And Paul didn't escape. If it had been me, I would have been out there like a flash. And uh, Paul stays and stops the jailer committing suicide and ends up, the jailer takes him uh, to his house and washes the wounds and he and his household are baptised and just all this dramatic, uh, these dramatic events are happening uh, and it's exciting. Paul, when he went on mission, exciting things happened. And that's what comes with the extension of God's kingdom. There's the opposition of the devil, but God wins through it all. Uh, anyhow, just in this story, just want to notice you to notice a few things. Uh, first of all, the core of guidance from God is twofold. The word of God and the spirit of God. So I don't need to elaborate 
much about that. The word of God, the truths, the wisdom there, it's like the framework of the house of our Christian life. The spirit of God, I think, like the furnishings. Every day, you know, we're using furniture, we have the Holy Spirit with us every day. So the framework's established, God's word's given to us. What a miracle that is, written over 1,600 years by about 40 people of all different occupations in three languages and etc. Our Bibles are a miracle. That's the framework of God's truth, the absolutes, God's wisdom for the Christian life. But then it's the Holy Spirit who brings the word to life and the furnishings, the furniture of that house. Uh, and so the Spirit and the Word are like the twofold core. The, I guess is the Word is the core of the steering column and the Spirit uh, around that. That's the hub, that's the centre. God's primary means of guidance. God's Word, God's Spirit. If it's against God's Word, don't go that way. It just brings trouble. You know, God says we should forgive others. Don't try and not forgive. It leads to disaster. You get all twisted up with bitterness and anger. And so God's word says, forgive. We humble ourselves. That's the principle. That's the truth, Lord. I choose to forgive that person. Um, the Holy Spirit facilitates worship. Don't kind of harden yourself. Though. I'm not going to be one of those, you know, charismatic Christians or, uh, you know, Soften your heart and worship. Flow with the Holy Spirit and wonderful benefits flow. So if we go against the word and against the spirit, we're headed for trouble. So establishing twofold core. Now, I ask the question, what are the spokes that connect to the hands-on steering wheel as we journey through life? What are the confirmatory factors that help us find God's will in specific situations? We have the word you have the Holy Spirit indwelling us uh, and the, the Holy Spirit's leading. And notice how, by the way, they were visiting the churches, teaching the apostles' teaching, which was like the Word of God, New Testament version until it was written down. Uh, and the Holy Spirit's clearly leading them. They're trying to go this way and the Holy Spirit stops them. Then trying to that, that way the Holy Spirit closes the door and the Holy Spirit's leading them. The Holy Spirit's trying to get them to lift their vision because they're thinking locally. They're thinking Bithynia and this and we go north or we go south or northeast or whatever. And the Holy Spirit's saying, no, overseas. I want you to think more largely, overseas. Uh, and so they're the, um, the basis, the core basis of God's guidance. Uh, it was interesting when Margaret had started to take ill, I didn't stop to think to ask God for revelation, to ask for the Holy Spirit for insight. I just kind of, we were just swept up in it all. Uh, I was going to get the caravan out later after a power nap, but she wanted to get out straight away. And then she's saying it's, so hot and I said well go inside just you go into the cool I'll fiddle around and then we'll get the caravan out and that's what happened she came out and hooked on caravan out without problems she drives I stand on the back and hold the pressure down to get the traction up the hill anyhow that all went perfectly I didn't know but she'd been downstairs to do washing or something instead of sitting in the cool uh, and then she for some unknown reason well, she was being helpful. She put the wheelie bin away, which I normally do, and she ended up lifting it up because you've got to kind of push it and lift it a bit to put it in position, and she got this severe pain in her left arm. So in her mind, and telling it to me, we just assumed she'd pulled a ligament or something lifting up this wheelie bin, but it was actually referred pain from the heart. Uh, she felt nauseous. I was blaming food poisoning, you know, the chicken burger for lunch, and... She was thinking allergic reaction. Uh, she actually vomited. I thought she'll come good. I prayed for her twice. Uh, you know, those kind of brief, somewhat anxious prayers. I actually prayed for her on two occasions. She was ailing. Um, I offered to take her down to emergency, but we're the kind of people that don't, you know, want to make a fuss particularly. With... But um, when she didn't recover after being nauseous, uh, I had this clear prompting. 
So I'd failed to even ask God what on earth's going on and just the natural mind. This is this and that's food poisoning and that's allergic reaction and she was sweating profusely. Well, don't tell me you sweat profusely. I do anyhow. I've only got to think about mowing in summer and I break out in a sweat. And yeah, for her it was very unusual. Um, symptoms and we weren't even thinking heart. She had no history of heart. Anyhow, the one good thing I did was I followed the Spirit's prompting to call my sister call Fiona, like this strong input, call Fiona. Uh, Fiona, my sister's a doctor. I called Fiona. The miracle was she answered the phone on holidays down at Woodburn on the farm. She answered the phone straight away and she said, you call the ambulance and get her down to emergency and don't delay and get her checked out. Even if it's not, get her checked out. And so Margaret didn't want me to call the ambulance again. Minimum fuss. So we quite quickly got in the car and I drove her down. I felt, I also followed the prompting, thankfully, to get her in through the door. Double parked, no park, waiting for someone to had their lights on to drive away, to take their park. They were doing what I sometimes do, the, all of us these days probably, looking at their phone, I'm sure. You start the car up and then you check your phone and someone's waiting for your car park. Anyhow, I double parked got her through the door, went off to park. By the time I came back, she'd been taken already from emergency in and in God's timing. It all happened. Thankfully, I wasn't there. I was diverted into a waiting room. And then the doctor came and said, you such and such, your wife's just had a cardiac arrest. But we've revived her. Thank you, Lord. Um, but the Holy Spirit's promptings, and, you know, sometimes we ignore them, sometimes we follow them. Thankfully, I followed that prompting to call my sister. Uh, so God's word, God's spirit. But what are these other spokes in the steering wheel? So let me give you the first one, the vision, uh, the man of Macedonia saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, I'm just using a bit of a play of words upon the word spoke. So the ma man of Macedonia spoke. So you got the picture, the core is the word in the spirit. The spokes lead out to the hands-on decision-making as we go through life. Needs. Revealed needs, serving scenarios are a great clue as to what God's will is. And God gives people a burden, a passion, vision. Paul got a literal vision of this man over in Macedonia. So that got them looking overseas to where God wanted them to go. Man of Macedonia, calling, come over and help us. Uh, and so God reveals needs to us, puts a burden on our mind and heart. There's needs around us that we just feel prompted. We need to meet. We can't meet all needs. We need to have that sense God's in this. Um, but as much as possible, we need, meet needs and God guides us through those serving opportunities. Serving scenarios, I call them, and that's what happened here. Now, there's conjecture about who this man of Macedonia was. No one really knows, but uh, some Bible commentators, and I tend to think this, uh, believe it's the man, uh, the Philippian jailer that he saw calling, come over and help us. And here we find out in heaven. So that's the first spoke. Uh, serving scenarios. Now, secondly, as we read on, uh, they sailed over there. They came to Philippi. Uh, they went down out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. There was no synagogue in Philippi. It was a military city rather than a commercial one. And so the Jewish habit was to pray by the riverside. And so Paul and his team head down to the riverside and engage in the prayer meeting. So prayer, speaking to God, talking to God. Prayer is so important in us finding God's will and God directing our lives. How often have you been in a prayer meeting and you get an impression, God reminds you about something, oh yes, I must do that, I must contact that person. Uh, Holy Spirit brings things to our remembrance or we just uh, have this kind of thought, we must do this, we must do that, we must address in prayer. And God loves us praying. He set the whole scheme up. 
as Christians, we can't neglect prayer. The challenge is to actually do it, and it's again, it's quality and quantity, but to talk to God every day, and it's in prayer, and often in prayer meetings together as we pray together, prayer is both individual and corporate, that God guides us, God leads us. So prayer is another spoke, and as God anoints us to pray, and the Holy Spirit loves prayer meetings, and loves to impress things on us and speak through us and bring encouragement. Uh, and so the anointing of the Spirit comes upon us as we flow in prayer. I love that they prayed by the riverside, the natural flow of the water and the spiritual flow of the Spirit as they unite their hearts in prayer. I think of that uh, miracle of, uh, I think it was a group of YWAMers years back in one of the island nations and they were out of food and they met on the river bank to pray for God to provide some food to meet their needs and several fish leapt out of the water and landed wriggling on the river bank and that was a quick answer to prayer to get some fish to cook and eat. So uh, prayer and then as we read on we see what I call the third spoke. Uh, we sat down, there's Paul and Luke and the others, we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. We spoke to the women who met there. Engagement with community. And as Christians, how important is church? Local church, God bless you, you've turned up today. That's a victory. The devil hates it, God loves it. Church connection, connecting into the Christian community. And Paul and the mission team intentionally engaged, engaged with the religious community of that day. They were yet to hear the gospel. They were Jewish. They loved God. Uh, and so there was that engagement in an environmental sense. They placed themselves in a conducive environment for them, it happened to be the Riverside prayer meeting. We place ourselves every Sunday in a conducive environment and we engage. Engage with the conducive environment for God to speak to us, God to lead us and God to work. And that is very powerful. So three spokes so far. These are the confirmatory clues to what God wants to guide us into, how God wants to direct us. Word and the spirit at the core, uh, but then we have the serving scenarios, the opportunities, the needs that God quickens us with. Um, some years ago, in the middle of winter, we thought there's people uh, in the city without warm clothing. Uh, it was just an obvious, simple need we could meet. So we declared a double jumper Sunday and everyone brought two coats, two jumpers, whatever, and gave one. And we were able to distribute that uh, into the, the homeless in the city. Um, so meeting of needs. Uh, secondly, the prayer promptings. The promptings as we go to prayer, God guides us, God leads us. Uh, and then now engagement uh, with community. Uh, and the Christian community is a wonderful, such a wonderful thing. Uh, when we, this happened to Margaret, uh, I was so grateful for two things for the Christian community. Firstly, the prayer chain. Somehow I managed in my fumbling around during the emergency, uh, as her heart was, she was being stabilised, to notify the prayer chain uh, and get people praying. That was such a comfort to me as I raced home and grabbed things and drove north. Such a comfort to know that there was a bunch of people praying because to get us safely up there to the John Flynn Hospital to have the stent put in. Such a comfort. And I've tended to put the requests on the prayer chain for years myself. Um, and sometimes they come at awkward times. You're trying to slip out of a meeting or something and put something on the prayer chain. Prayer, the power of prayer, praying for one another. What a blessing. The other thing uh, was provision of meals. Oh, that was a blessing to me as well as Margaret. 
Dave, Pastor Dave Winter, told the church I'm hopeless in the kitchen. And so these wonderful people who provide meals, including your own pastors, Alan and Jackie, brought a meal around. We are, were so grateful, so blessed. Margaret was blessed to eat decent food. I was blessed to not have to try and cook decent food. And uh, now it's, uh, she gives me instructions and, yeah, it's not that I was, couldn't do meals, but... Well, let's just say my culinary expertise is on the increase. Proving very domesticated. Um, but what a blessing to be part of a community that give help. Uh, God helps you in time of need. Uh, so then as we read on, the fourth spoke is where they come to... Uh, oh, here in verse 15... <clears throat> Uh, verse 14, sorry, uh, about the woman Lydia. And it says, uh, who worshipped God, the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. So uh, key ministry. Engaging in, with and receiving key ministry from God via church ministry, church leaders, key people, in your life, who are mentors, key ministry, and God can say so much and do so much and guide us so much through placing ourselves in the circle of ministry influence. Now, these days, you can listen to podcasts and online and so on, so uh, there's more options than ever for really uh, tapping into key ministry, but nothing beats the local church leadership, let me say, homemade bread, local church leadership. So as you sit and receive key ministry input, God will use that to guide you, to confirm things, to steer you according to his will, his plan for your life. And so not only engagement with the local church community, but receiving ministry. Uh, Ephesians 4 talks about a pest, a pest. I'm gonna say a pest, not a pest. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds and teachers. Fivefold ministry giftings given to people and therefore the equipping of the saints. And so as we receive that ministry, uh, God works through those uh, with ministry gifts or leadership, uh, whatever, and God can speak to our lives. And there's key people. I know I was greatly encouraged by the ministry of Pastor Trevor Chandler, over many years, he's now gone uh, to be with the Lord, uh, but he was like the apostle, the founder of the movement of churches that we belong to. Uh, also had the privilege of working with um, local men of God like uh, Pastor Terry Boyle. Uh, but Trevor Chandler is one who stands out uh, in my mind and there will be those that God will use to uh, really encourage you in serving the Lord, but also guide you. Uh, and so Lydia responded to the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Uh, she opened her heart, God moved, and then uh, God prompted her to offer her house to be the facility uh, for the very first church in Europe. And this is spoke number five. Five spokes. Spoke number five is open doors. And so Lydia, whose life has been transformed as God's moving, she's responding to the spirit, the teaching of Paul, and she just opens a house to uh, accommodate uh, the new church plant. And she's just uh, a woman with some wealth, apparently, a business lady and so on, and influence. And so as she responded to key ministry, she became a key person in God uh, for the extension of God's kingdom in Philippi and the planting of this church. Open doors. Doors open. Open doors are a wonderful thing. I, when I delivered Margaret to the door of the emergency department, it was an open door to enter to receive medical help as they ushered her in through other doors. doors. Open doors. God gives us open doors. And his blessing is on that. And we can step through in faith and trust. Don't try and beat yourself against the closed door. I mean, test doors. Is this closed? Is this open? Is this God? Is this...
someone else another time. And so, opportunities, invitations, open doors. Go through them, step through them with faith and see how God will lead and God will bless. Uh, can I uh, just suggest that you add those five spokes to your guidance uh, toolbox as you seek God in the decisions of life. Uh, you're here because you have a heart to serve. You want God's will. You don't want to be steered off course by the devil. And the devil loves to veer us away. God steers. The devil veers. Veers us off into drifting and diversions. But let's set our hearts to follow God's will. To pursue that. To seek that. The word, the spirit. And then the confirmation through the revealed uh, needs and opportunities to serve through prayer, uh, through engaging with the community, through key ministry, and then through open doors. And to anyone take notes, S-P-O-K-E, spoke, they line up not the correct order, but with those letters. God guiding us, confirming us, steering us, directing us into his will, his plans, the best possible thing for us, uh, saving us from getting lost, protecting us from the detours of the devil so we can steer forward in his purpose and like it says of David of old, serving God according to, serving our generation according to the will of God and seeing much fruit, much blessing, much extension of God's kingdom in these days. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time in your presence. We just ask that you would, Lord, work afresh in our lives by your Spirit, that we would really find your plans, your purpose, that we would serve our generation according to your will. Not our ideas or others' ideas or the devil's detours, but Lord, that we would steer forward in your purpose. Because we know in your purpose, whilst there may, may be opposition, there will be opposition. We have victory in your name, Lord Jesus, the name that is above every other name. We have the power of your spirit to help us over every opposition, over every hurdle, through and to serve you with effectiveness and to experience much blessing and much fruitfulness. We thank you for your love. Thank you that you are our keeper our protector. Thank you that you are doing miracles all around us. Often we don't even notice. Thank you, Lord, for that power of your spirit afresh, that fresh wind blowing as we set our hearts to serve you in these days for your praise, for your glory, in your name. Just as we're bowed in prayer, I'd like to just pray a prayer for any who I have never asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Saviour and you'd like to do so today. Or maybe you've known the Lord and you've just become distant and you want to declare your heart commitment afresh to follow Jesus. Would you just pray this prayer meaningfully in your heart along with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your love for me. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you went to the cross that you died in our place for our failings, our sins on the cross. And you rose again triumphantly from the dead. And you offer us the greatest gift of all, the gift of eternal life. Lord Jesus, I declare you as my Lord and Saviour. I choose in my heart to follow you. And I pray for the power of your Spirit to help me every day, to live for you, to witness to my faith, to serve you and to experience victory in your name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer for the first time, I'd love to meet you at the close of the service and to share, share a little bit with you. Uh, if you'd like prayer today, I'm very happy to pray. Uh, if anyone just seeking clarity at this point in time, I had a sense that there's someone who's really got a decision-making dilemma and you're trying to do it all in your own, Lord, we just encourage you to ask the advice of trusted people. Just ask some advice. Someone else who's just 
your head's confused, that's these, all these things that God would say, not just your head, but your heart. Listen to my voice in your heart. God bless you if you like prayer. Just come out of the place of the service.